Hi, I'm uh, Gavin Smith from the School of Sociology um, at INCAS Research School of Social Sciences. I'm very honoured to be alongside uh, Professor Michael McRobbie, um, who is among many things the 18th President of Indiana University, a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, an Honorary Fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities, an Officer of the Order of Australia and, significantly, the ANU Alumnus of the Year 2015, which is fabulous. Professor McRobbie, welcome back to the ANU and many congratulations to you on your receiving this prestigious award. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. It's a delight to be back at ANU as always. Fabulous. Um, so you graduated from ANU with a PhD in philosophy 35 years ago mm -hmm. or so. Um, can you perhaps describe in brief terms the key events that have propelled you to your current role as president of IU, a university that has over 7,000 faculty and nearly 115, or maybe now over 115,000 students. Um, so I'd just like to ask, yeah, some of the key events as you see them that's led to this. Oh, I, I think one, one of the key events was that uh, uh, right towards the end of my PhD uh, research here, uh, I, I started to get interest in interested in the, the application of certain computational techniques in the work that that, uh, that I was doing. Um, there were a, a number of other people who were working in uh, uh, related areas who had just started to um, uh, use computational techniques in, in other ways as well. And sort of one thing led to the other and I, I uh, basically my career moved into information technology uh, very rapidly. And uh, when I came back here, uh, as a faculty member in uh, 1983, I uh, really started to pursue um, those areas and I got involved um, due to uh, a request from the then Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Ian Ross, a man who I have an enormously high opinion of and very sad he passed away some years ago, but, uh, but and he was a great mentor to me. Uh, but Ian... Uh, really asked me to take on some significant administrative roles in building up information technology. And then the other piece of great fortune was um, I, I became very close friends with, with Robin Stanton, who I think uh, his last position here was as Pro Vice Chancellor, one of the truly great servants of uh, ANU. And he and I became extremely close collaborators for the rest of my time at, at ANU. And uh, I think there were a number of things that we accomplished there. So I, I, I was more and more involved in aspects of information technology and mm. some of the things we've done here it attracted the attention of people in the United States and in particular at Indiana University where I had um, connections for, for other reasons going back many years and when the position was created of Chief Information Officer I was invited to apply uh, which I did and was, was appointed in 19, uh, actually at the end of 96 but I took up the position at the beginning of 97, so for nearly 20 years now I've been, uh, I've been at Indiana University. Thank you very much. Let's, let's, let's return to sunny Canberra for a moment, <laughs> if, if we may. Um, can I ask what were some of your fondest memories from your time at the ANU? What are some things that really stand out about what makes ANU such a fabulous place to study? To, yeah. yeah to oh, I, I mean, it, the, the intellectual atmosphere mm. at, at ANU, I mean, I can't speak about every Australian university, I haven't been at every Australian university, but the, the intellectual atmosphere here is as good as the best American universities in, in, in my experience. Um, the, the, the time when I was an undergraduate, uh, there would be one legendary speaker after the other in, in, uh, in different fields, and I would take advantage of it when you're a graduate student, you at least have some free time to do these things to go and listen to people from other fields. So, for example, I heard Paul Dirac, the, the famous um, uh, uh, physicist, then alive since passed away, uh, come and give a number of lectures here. Um, Sir Isaiah Berlin was a resident here, I think, for a couple of weeks. So I heard him give three or four lectures. And it just went on like uh, Roger Penrose was here for a period. Uh, so pe people, people like that would come through all the time. And I think... Um, the, the ability to be able to, to see people of that, of that quality in a whole range of different disciplines was, was wonderful. Also, I think um, because of, I don't know whether they still exist, but the ANU PhD scholarships, which I had one, um, which were used to attract uh, very good students from around Australia and around the world, I think, uh, attracted really extraordinary students here. And, and I had uh, the great fortune of, 
of working with um, some some uh, then uh, students, but people who went on to do good things in their in their careers, and just the quality of um, the the faculty here. It really was the case that in the Institute for Advanced Studies where I was, um, by and large, the the the, the people who were the faculty there uh, were just world class figures. Um, and uh, and had had uh, in many cases world class reputations, uh, so so all of that made this just a, a superb intellectual environment, and on top of that, it is um, and I'm happy to say this on air, it is the most beautiful campus in Australia. It really is a st it's stunningly beautiful campus. I walked around yesterday afternoon for a few hours, and it is just as beautiful and and it has got some really interesting innovative architecture. And all credit to those responsible for pushing the architectural envelope a bit. Thank you very much. Um, the College of Arts and Sciences of Indiana University and ANU College of Arts and Social Sciences have recently extended this uh, very exciting exchange agreement for faculty and students. What are your thoughts on the importance of exchanges between universities? Something I know from looking into your biography, you're, you're, you, this is something you're a proponent of, mm -hmm. internationalisation, these kinds yes. of outreaches. Yes. Um, and what can people coming to Indiana University expect in terms of Bloomington as a place to work, to study and to live? Well, well Bloomington, Indiana is, is the quintessential American college town. I mean, there are dozens, probably hundreds of, of college towns uh, like Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we, of course, are a very, very large university. We're a member of the what's called the AAU, the equivalent of the Group of Eight in Australia. Uh, so, so a student coming to to Bloomington uh, goes to a large uh, university, extremely high quality university. With um, we've had uh, eight Nobel Prize winners there, um, and including, including uh, recently the first woman to get the Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, and and so they have this. Uh, really outstanding intellectual environment as well, with with again the same kind of enormous diversity that that ANU has, um, and uh, but you get it in a small town, um, in in the in the rural uh, Midwest, um, which is which is a very different environment than being in a big city, even Canberra certainly than being in a place like Sydney, and certainly being in a big American city, Chicago or or uh, you know Detroit or New York or something like that. And and uh, that that I think um, has has proven to be uh, just enormously attractive to to, to students to to have that um, experience. It's an experience, frankly, not unlike that that you have at Oxford or Cambridge. It's that kind of a, an experience where, by and large, you're in a relatively s small city in a kind of rural environment. Fabulous! It sounds very attractive. Um, you have um, a background in both computer science and the liberal humanities. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about the role and significance of interdisciplinary and trans-institutional scholarship in a world that's becoming infinitely more connected and complex? Uh, well, I, I, I just, I'm a huge supporter and proponent of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary studies. Uh, I, I just think that um, uh, many of the most interesting problems and the most creative solutions to problems come out of multidisciplinary collaborations. But having said that, uh, I always want to emphasize that you still need the, um, the disciplinary pillars. Um, people still need the, the deep education in, in, uh, in one or more areas, but, but then have the, the flexibility and, the, and the, 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 the breadth of interest to be able to um, consider uh, the, the techniques and knowledge and expertise that they have in the context of, of broader problems that may involve um, uh, dozens of dozens of other people. I mean, it is. I, I know it's a feature here of, of uh, many programs at ANU. It is certainly the feature of many programs at, at IU and, of course, many other great American universities. Thank you. Um, looking forward prophetically, um, how do you envisage the university system of 2050? Uh, what do you anticipate to be the key dimensions, structures and features of higher education delivery as we move through the 21st century? Difficult question, but I'd just love to well, gather your thoughts on I, that. I, it's, it's, it is an interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm a great believer that, that the best predictor to the future is the past. And, and the, the, the university system we have today and the, um, uh, the, the structure of universities although modified Im immensely in all kinds of different areas, is not that different to what it was a thousand years ago. Uh, it consists of people who are acknowledged expertise in some field of 
uh, some field of study. They profess um, certain views and 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 beliefs, uh, and and do so with you know great rigor and a, a great level of depth. And and then students who wish to acquire that knowledge um, uh, for their uh, life experiences uh, work with those professors to 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 achieve that. And that's been the model going back, in fact, 25 centuries to when we have the earliest rec records of uh, the first universities. And it hasn't changed an enormous amount. The, what you can think of is the, is the infrastructure's change. We, we now have uh, pervasive information te technology. Um, uh, we, we have um, uh, uh, a completely secular education, at least in most, most institutions. Um, we we have uh, still have academic freedom, uh, uh, certainly in, in uh, many universities, um, certainly in the United States and here in Australia, sort of guaranteed by uh, by tenure, uh, and, and and so on. Um, uh, but but I think the basic experience is still the same. So I still think the university of the future uh, is going to be similar to what it is today. Now, um, online education is is touted as 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 maybe going to revolutionise that. I'm sceptical of that, although I certainly acknowledge that the impact of technology as it gets better and better and as the virtual experience gets better and better is going to, is going to um, incrementally uh, increase the role that it plays. But I don't, I don't see ever the talking head, no matter how good the technology, ever really replacing firstly that direct connection between the student and the, and the, uh, the, the, the instructor. Um, uh, or uh, in any way really replacing the interaction between students uh, themselves. It's, as I said before, it's just such an important part of a, of a student's education in, a, in the kind of residential experience that you get here at uh, ANU, for example. That's a fabulous answer, and I, I fully agree with uh, your, your sentiments there. Last, last uh, uh, topic, if, if we may. You and I evidently share a mutual interest in the emergence of big data as the new oil yes. of information-rich <laughs> societies, and your last response has beautifully led us onto this, and as a resource that is increasingly used to profile social life and activity. I, I, I might be, uh, understand that you see the use of digital technologies and the preservation of digital knowledge as, as, as a solution to some of the economic and social problems um, currently burdening America and global society and thinking here of issues in health, education and security context. Can you perhaps tell us what role you see information technologies and digital infrastructures playing in the educational realm in particular, and you have mentioned some of these things, but in society more generally, how can the university um, use these kinds of platforms to really engage and mobilise communities more broadly? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think one of the one of the most important things that that what, what is called, I guess, generically big big data has has enabled is is to, to be able to aggregate and amass data on such a scale that you can actually start to extract useful information from that data. I think there was there was a point where databases simply didn't have enough information in them to be able to, to extract um, interesting new information. Obvious stuff could be extracted, that's what they were set up for in the first place, but it's when the, the unexpected uh, connections um, occur um, or when you when you're actually making genuine sort of discoveries based on big data, no, no matter what the field, that that's where I think it can be really impactful. I know that one of the motivating arguments about the future of online education is is that the amount of data that will be collected, um, monitoring the the online learning experiences of students, um, can in, can in turn be be mined for ways in which that experience can be improved. And I think up to a point, I think that's that's exactly right. Um, uh, whether whether those improvements are other than incremental, or whether there's, as some people would claim, um, sort of seismic uh, uh, directions forward uh, there, I think is yet to be yet to be determined. But there's no doubt that that will have an impact on on learning um, in ways that probably aren't even clear completely at, at the moment. But um, uh, I, I'm I'm also interested in, in another problem. Um, which is which is not at all glamorous, and it's the problem of the long-term preservation of, of data. And I'm not talking five years, ten years, or even twenty years. I'm talking fifty years, hundred years, two hundred years. And uh, most of the formats in which data is stored today are are highly perishable. Data is thrown away 
or is inaccessible for a whole range of reasons, um, and an, frankly, I think at, at an alarming rate. So um, in the US, we set up a number of years ago an organization called the Digital Preservation Network, which I chair the board at the moment, which is focused on this issue of the um, ultra long-term preservation of data so that um, uh, one starts thinking about data in the same way that, that one thinks about the preservation of books from medieval libraries. Mm. And that's, that's the kind of model here. Why, ha, how did um, the, the, why did the Platonic Dialogues, or how do the Platonic Dialogues still exist today, um, given they were written 25 centuries ago, um, and all the tumultuous events that have taken place between now and then? And how can we ensure that the very best uh, work that is now only available digitally, as you know, in, in many of the sciences, all new data is only being generated digitally. How can we ensure that that is around petabytes of it, exabytes of it? How can we ensure that that's around uh, in um, in another 200 years? That's a, a fabulous thing to think about, and, and it's a, you make a very good point about the platonic and uh, you know it, the maintenance of particular um, you know particular forms of knowledge. And I think that's a, a fabulous way to end. Think about how the university it might be the custodian and the archive of that kind of knowledge in the future, and how we can we, we can use these these digital technologies very productively in order to achieve that end. Gavin, would you mind if I I just came back because I realised there was a question earlier that I I didn't fully give you an answer to, and that was when you asked me about the collaboration between our IU and ANU. Yeah, sure. um, let me just say just a couple of words about that too. Yeah, um, we, about five years ago, the then Vice Chancellor, Professor Ian Chubb and I, uh, agreed to set up what we call the Pan-Asian Institute. And this institute basically takes the whole of Pan, what we call Pan-Asia, which really goes from Turkey through to the Pacific Islands, and it, it, it tries to leverage our complementary expertise. For example, ANU is very strong in Southeast Asian mm -hmm. studies, probably maybe if not uh, the best, sort of one of the best places mm -hmm. in the world for Southeast Asian studies, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc. We are very strong in particular in Central Eurasian studies, uh, the stands um, uh, and, and uh, into, into China. Um, and uh, we teach languages that are hardly taught anywhere else in the world, the languages of, the, uh, of Central Eurasia. And of course, you have expertise in the languages of Southeast Asia. So the goal of the centre uh, really is to, for us to access your expertise, in particular in Southeast Asia, but in other areas, and for you to access our expertise in, in Central Eurasian studies and so on, where we're among the top uh, three or four places in the United States in that area as well. And it has been, um, in my view, very successful. We've had multiple exchanges between our institutions. We've had a number of joint conferences, a lot of publications have, have come out of it. We've had, ex we've had students visit uh, both institutions. And because of that, because of its success, um, Vice Chancellor Young and I are signing uh, an extension for a further five years of, of that agreement this afternoon. That's a fabulous way to end. Thank you so much for your time, Professor Michael McRobbie, and congratulations again for you Thank being you. the 2015 uh, ANU Alumnus of the Year. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.